So good morning, everyone. Lovely to have you all here with us. Uh, it's a very sunny morning in southern Germany, which means, paradoxically enough, that you don't see me a lot because I can't and I don't want really to stop the sunshine from coming in. <laughs> um, I hope you're all doing all right. And we're going to discuss the third aspect of our path together this morning. We're going to talk about Samma Sati and Samma Samadhi and in a minute. But first of all, let me say I'm going to have this yeah, monologue, <laughs> not a conversation, um, with you in the beginning. I'm going to try to give some inspiration and some impulses there. And then we are going to meditate and practice with that. And finally, then we can collect your um, ideas and your reflections, how practice was for you, what you maybe discovered through the past couple of days and um, in the last couple of uh, 10, 15 minutes of our session. You can use the chat box, just the chat box where you say hello and good morning to each other. Um, you can use that to type those messages and maybe just in capital letters like reflection or thought or question, and I will respond to that. And uh, finally, at the end of the session, you will see um, the link. And if you wish to support Sangha Life and the teachers, uh, we get a part of uh, the donation you're sending. Um, we, of course, very much appreciate that for to continue these sessions to run and to continue the teachers to make their living. So thank you very much for your generosity. Yeah. OK, then let's get started. We talked. Wisdom, cultivate cultivation of wisdom on Tuesday, some uh, ditti perspective on some Sankapa the appropriate uh, intention on Tuesday. Yesterday, we talked a lot about ethics, including how we communicate, how we make our living in this world, and I would even include um, what we consume. We are consumers by nature. We can't help. Yeah, we, we, we need, we depend upon. So we inevitably consume from nature, from other beings, and the Buddha invited us to give good thought on how we're going to do that. Yeah, We will inevitably impact the world with our being. So can we do this in a beautiful way? Yeah, In a beautiful, respectful way. Okay. And the final one was appropriate action, very much around the ethics. And we talked a lot yesterday about what a liberated, let me call, that, call it this way, a liberated ethic means, one which is liberated from shame and guilt and instead find something beautiful and something to appreciate within the ethics. How could that look like? Yeah. And today we're going to talk about the third aspect of the Eightfold Path, um, which many of us in intuitively maybe would interpret as the practice. Yeah, so that is samasati and samasamadhi. Sati, you know, is what we in English usually translate as mindfulness. Yeah, and samadhi, I'll come to in a minute, but is this collection, gathering of the whole being in something. Yeah, so <clears throat> here we have those two aspects together, they make but a fourth, a fourth of the entire Eightfold Noble Path, and yet gets an overemphasis in our Western Dharma world, yeah? As if everything would be mindfulness and samadhi. And samadhi even gets then oh, chunked down to meditation, to a certain form of meditation even. So it becomes a very narrow window, yeah? And I like, really, really like to question that this morning. Mm, the Buddha actually didn't even say to meditate a lot. You can go through the um, texts and his teachings and you will not actually find the word meditate, you'll find the word bhavana. And bhavana actually means to cultivate, to develop, yeah, to cultivate and to develop and to watch to develop our heart minds, citta. Sometimes in the Western 
uh, literature, or you would maybe equal that roughly, roughly to the psyche or to the nervous system, yeah, or to both, <laughs> to cultivate that aspect of ours, this heart mind, yeah, of ours. It's our sensitivity, yeah, that which is touched by inner and outer experience, yeah, touch, 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 touch all the time. And that which responds and reacts to that. Something touches and something reacts. Yeah, Something is touched and something reacts. On that the Buddha, this wholeness, the Buddha would call citta, heart mind. And in these reactions, yeah, and even in this way of being touched, um, you will notice all kind of patterns and perspectives really. Um, we all know this, oh, if this touches me, this is my standard habitual reaction to. We also have standard habitual ways of looking at things, yeah. And without any cultivation, all kinds of patterns can sprout. Not only, not necessarily only the the ugly ones, those which um, make us feel pain and, and stress, yeah. They, of course, some beautiful ones also will develop. But without any cultivation, the Buddha said, this chitta is kind of a wild animal. He, he compared it to an elephant or a horse. Beautiful, majestic beings. They were very much appreciated in ancient India. And how powerful and how yeah, uh, graceful such an elephant and a horse can be, really. But it has a lot of beauty in it and a lot of power to create havoc. Yeah. And this is where he says, let's use the energy of the heart mind of this beautiful wild animal and let's cultivate that. Let's gently, gently and with a lot of patience guiding it to directions where the energy is used well. And this is what we do. We practice bhavana. We practice bhavana in the everyday. We practice it on the cushion. We practice it in meditation. We practice it while talking with each other. We practice it while being in nature. Yeah, we cultivate our heart minds. And we, every moment of practice, one of my teachers once said to me, no moment of mindfulness, no moment of practice is ever lost. We'll make it a tiny, the tiniest bit more likely that Chitta will express a quality which is beautiful, which will protect our being and the being of others, which will nourish our being, and which will make it more able to relate to others and experience in a oh, peaceful, free, calm, caring way. Yeah. So that is the whole of bhavana. And I, I really like to emphasize this. It's much more than just meditation. And <clears throat> this aspect of cultivation, we find it both in the mindfulness and in the samadhi. So let me explore. What quality do we cultivate when we practice mindfulness? Mm, to me, a large aspect of practicing mindfulness is to cultivate my way of paying attention. Yeah, my atten our attention, your attention. I don't know how you how much you're aware of that, but it's actually a precious, precious gift. We all know we can pay attention to something only for so long and only for such and such an intensity before it starts to shift. Yeah, And when we pay attention to one thing, we exclude a lot of the other things out of our field of attention. So it's almost like choosing something, neglecting yeah, something else. And when we pay, truly pay attention in meditation or in calm moments during the day, we also notice, well, it's a bit of an unstable gift. Yeah? It's not so much my willpower, but I have moments, and we can do that in meditation later, where we notice, oh, I'm not the boss. <laughs> I'm not in control of my attention at all times. Sometimes I'm just sitting there and watching my mind go hop and hop and hop, or it's just a very foggy day where it can't really be in touch with anything. And that, so we notice that, well, yeah, we can have the intention to pay attention, but actually I pay attention is a misunderstanding a lot of the times. 
So what we pay attention to will impact us. If this weren't true, we would not have any advertisement. Yeah. Advertisement is, uh, is asking for our gift of attention. Pay attention to me so I can impact you. Yeah. And the Buddha noticed that as well. What we pay attention to will have a rippling effect on our being. And this is part of the art form of mindfulness. If we allow our attention to run loose, we might pick up that which makes us happy and that which nourishes us a bit, but it's also very likely, and we remember the, um, the biases we have to pay more attention to the problematic and the painful and the difficult. If we allow our attention to just run loose, we might pick up all kinds of things which stir in ease and dukkha. So you might, I don't know where you started your mindfulness practice, or if you started your mindfulness practice, um, with any of these basic mindfulness uh, tasks, but they were so empty to me in the beginning. Like, why on earth should I pay attention to just brushing my teeth? Um, my mind has this habit of, if it doesn't understand, it goes into rebellion mode. So um, I couldn't do these exercises for very long, to be honest. Until not I understood this underlying principle of, oh, what I'm doing is to cultivate my attention. It doesn't really matter if I do this by brushing my teeth or carrying the hot teapot to the table or being out in nature. What I do is to cultivate my attention, to say, oh, come here and um, soften around that and can we look at this because this makes me feel different. And even to say, oh, I'm paying attention to this experience. What does that do? What does that do to the beingness? To become curious about the ways in which we pay attention. And to understand any practice which takes this attention and puts it on one thing, like breathing or something in nature, looking at the details of some beautiful flower or something, not as an exertion of mindfulness where we want. Now I'm going to pay attention, bring a lot of effort up. But it can be and has become over the years for me really a form of protecting and safeguarding the mind. When I notice, oh, if I don't do this, if the horse is running wild, it goes to places and pays attention to things which will create dukkha and which will foster motivations and intentions within me which do not feel wholesome at all. So come, dear mind, let's pay attention to something which is going to nourish and soothe and calm. Yeah. So these whole exercises of mindfulness, if we ask for the why, the underlying reason, it becomes, to me at least, a whole different ball game. So we decide to put our attention where it nourishes us, where it brings us ease, where it brings clarity, calm, and a sense of connection, yeah, connection. And once the mind is stabilized and then we come to samadhi, we can look at the challenging things um, until they uproot, <laughs> until they make the attention brittle again. And then often we say, well, well enough, enough. I can't hold that in attention and why is attention appropriate mindfulness anymore so that is that is something maybe you never thought of it came late to me that it's called samma sati it's appropriate it's conducive mindfulness meaning that there are ways of being mindful which are not samma samadhi and not samma sati meaning you can be mindful in ways which are not conducive yeah not beneficial Ever heard of that? There are ways to be mindful which don't do a lot or even harm. Yeah. And one of the ways where I notice this is when I ask, how am I mindful? Yeah. How am I paying attention? Did you ever see that there is a relationship between the observer and the observed? Between that which one pays attention to? and almost the quality in the gaze of looking, in the way of looking. We can watch it some, we can watch something with very critical or fearful or distrusting or analytical ways, yeah? Um, 
we can look at something just trying to understand on a very cognitive way. Um, we can look at something with a lot of pressure, almost like zooming in with a lot of effort. Yeah, we can go very close to something, whereas it would be equally well to explore, to allow a lot of space and zoom out. Yeah. Um, so how do we pay attention? Not only what do we pay attention to, but how do we pay attention to learn all this um, different aspects and to become malleable in our ways of paying attention is all part of the mindfulness aspect. So the leading question of this path, I would like to sum it up here, is what do I want to make the gift of attention to? And how do I want to do this? I'm going to copy this in for you later. What do I want to make the gift of attention to? And how, how do I want to do this? If you put it like this, it's liberated from any form, from, from formal meditation, from any um, way of practicing, really. It becomes something which can be applied all day long. Yeah. Second aspect, Sama Samadhi. So here we have another one of those <laughs> translational challenges. Samadhi, unfortunately, I think, often gets translated as concentration. And then the whole package becomes right concentration. And I can't, if I even hear that, I can notice how hmm, my effort levels just like zzz, <laughs> activate. Yeah, Pay right attention. Uh, pay, um, practice right concentration <laughs> um, and that gets equal to meditation and then we have like a real challenge yeah if summer samadhi is right concentration and that happens in meditation we become we, well, we get those meditations where we so effortfully concentrate on breathing that breathing becomes really painful even if it wasn't earlier we, we get those meditations where we get really frustrated because the concentration just does not establish and um for some of us this can get like really straining a really straining practice so let us get it back to appropriate samadhi and remember what samadhi actually is i did a whole i think last year this time a whole week on on an exploration of samadhi and it's the gathering the gathering and the collection of our beingness in one experience, yeah, to say, let's bring all the fragmented parts, let's invite them back, yeah, and the pushes and the pulls, let's soften them and soothe them and allow the being to rest deeply, yeah. So, right concentration, I don't find the word very appealing because it neglects, it doesn't emphasize this deep form of care and protection which samadhi practice actually is. It's not a form of meditative exertion. It's a form of caring for the being. And again, we are liberated from the form. Yes, you can do that on your cushion in cross-legged position. And you can do that being out in nature, standing before a tree, gathering your attention, your whole being and experiencing being with the tree, you know, self dissolves. We don't need the self in that moment, just like the presence of the tree, touching, um, smelling, hearing, all gathered in this experience. And that would be an experience of samadhi. Some people experience samadhi when they paint or when they play the beloved instrument. Yeah, you know, something dissolves. Here we have samadhi practice. It's not exclusive to formal practice on the cushion. And of course, now that sounds lovely, does it? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have all those moments all day long. Um, part of the samadhi practice is to learn about our heart mind, yeah, to care for the being, say, okay, at the moment it's hard to settle because there's a sense of lack of something, there's a sense of lack of safety, something feels abandoned, something feels rejected, something feels isolated. And the pushes and the pulls continue because there's this sense of something is not okay. I can't settle. Yeah. There's this underlying activation still going on. I can't settle. And part of the Samadhi practice is to learn how to care for that. 
to truly learn how to care for the heart mind. It's not about having altered states of consciousness and jhanas and all that. Yeah, it's deeply learning how to take care of the heart mind. And the leading question here would be, dear heart mind, how do I take best care of you when you are like this? We did that, you remember, Tuesday. This is how my heart mind is this morning. Not how I would like it to be, but this is how it is. What would you need? What can I offer you? So, and, and to have this conversation, to have this conversation with the heart mind. Great. I'll copy the questions in later. And now we're going to practice sati and samadhi. Find yourself a posture, sitting, standing, lying down, whatever you wish to uh, try out and experiment with. Maybe freeing the being a bit from the cross-legged form on experimenting with what other postures there are and when they might serve you and your body. And while doing so, we take a little inventory. We first need to know whom we are meeting today. What bodily energies, energies of the heart, the mind, the attention, before we can start practicing. Because we don't want to practice, impose practice upon body, heart and mind. We want to practice with, with. So how is body this morning? The bodily sensations loud or very subtle, demanding or rather unspectacular. Just by being here in this posture, posture of your choice, any movements, any adjustments you can make to support the body so that there doesn't, so that posture doesn't generate any pushes and pulls saying, oh, this is uncomfortable, I'm held in this uncomfortable position. Anything, any tension, mature, ripe enough to be softened and released. If you like, take a couple of breaths and invite them, just invite them to your lower belly, maybe even a hand on the lower belly. So this is where the invitation goes. Or a hand on the back, the lower back, if we forget breathing into the back of the body.
now that we've met our body, dear body, this morning, we know some of its energies, we know who we practice with. Now let's explore the heart. Maybe there are some moods and emotions, obvious ones, subtler ones, or maybe it's pretty unspectacular. We don't need to make anything up. And sometimes we don't have names, so just feel it out. If there are loud emotions calling, pay them a little attention, acknowledge them, saying, yeah, I see, there's a lot going on within. But no need right now to submerge in them or to listen to all their storyline. Maybe some gentle words of compassion saying, yeah, I know, dear hide. There is some contraction, some dynamic within which is troubling you. I'll take care of you the best I can. And then explore your thoughts and the thinking. Lots of thoughts popping up, lots of images or little or the whole storylines like trains passing through. The mind can be like this busy secretarian. already planning out the day for you. It has the to-do lists ready and the points of importance marked in bright red. Sometimes it's just this thought popping up. And then a pause, and then a thought is popping up. And finally, final item of our inventory, how is the quality of attention this morning? Were you able to settle with the attention somewhere? Or is it rather this hopping, drifting feeling, being a little in touch, but not, not, not really close to the experience? Or is it a bit foggy? Or is attention consumed by something which is regularly called back to? Just notice, and no need to make it any difference. The question is really, could you? Could you without putting a lot of effort and with power into the system? So now that we explored whom we are meeting this morning, let's ask this gentle question. Dear heart, mind, dear body, 
I wish to nourish you. I wish to offer you some rest and replenishment. And to do so, I wish to guide you into a simple, easy experience. Just that, just that. What would you choose? What would you offer your attention as a resting place, a nest? It doesn't have to be breathing. It could be something you can look at with your eyes. It can be something you listen to. It could even be a gentle way of moving, rocking from one sitting bone to the other, hands touching something, massaging something gently and slowly. You can dance, you can stand up and dance. And setting this intention of caring and protecting the heart-mind. We do not so forcefully yank at the attention. We might even have a little understanding that it it has important things to do. One can only wish it for a second or two before it has to go again and needs to be re-invited. Knowing our attention is foggy or out of touch this morning, we will not be so surprised if we only have this drifting, vague feeling that belongs, that's dependent upon the quality of attention this morning. And if there are things which push and pull at the attention, saying, no, we don't have time for this Samadhi thing. There are important, threatening, painful things to consider. We might notice that this is not bad behavior. This is a hard hurting, not feeling safe, not feeling nourished. How can I practice with you? What can I do for you? If it doesn't get overwhelming, you can be with that push and pull and gently breathe with it. Maybe touch with the hands that place where you feel it the most within the body. And see if a little care and compassion softens that pushing, pulling, calling, demanding. Sankara, this urge.
And if it gets overwhelming, you don't have to do that. You can protect the being by bringing the attention elsewhere. If it's overwhelming, take your attention gently by the hand and say, not now, not stable enough, not rooted enough to look at that. Bring it somewhere where you feel a little more stability. You can open up your eyes and look around. And whatever you choose as your anchor, as your, the nest for your attention, show, clearly show the heart and mind to say, have you felt, have you recognized the softness or the spaciousness, the calmness or the stillness, maybe even a little pleasantness or joyfulness in this little experience. Drink it in, it's for you. And samadhi can be a very slow process where tiny experiences of well-being over time soften and calm and soothe the being. So can you give yourself the gift of patience? And even if it doesn't feel like 
very samadhi-ish this morning. Just have this little trust in this sentence. No moment of caring for the heart-mind is ever lost. The result might be not exactly what it, what you expected and how you would like it to feel and be like, but it's really not lost what we're doing here. This thoughts are still circling and the body is still demanding. Maybe that's what it is this morning. And maybe it's not going to change anytime soon. So how would you like to be with it? Maybe take the effort out of it. Maybe stop telling ourselves the story of I can only I will only be okay when I arrived on the other side of it. And look for the small well beings which are here, even though that painful nagging pattern is still alive and well. And then, as we come to the end, let's not look for the result of the meditation, but just end it gracefully, taking care of the heart, mind, body, under tension this morning. Maybe a glimpse of appreciation to have done this practice, to have showed up, to have met, to be in contact with these inner dynamics, As someone said it the other day, that was a courageous little act. To feel some appreciation for doing this practice, well done. And then finally start stretching and moving, yawning, sighing, breathing deeply if you like. <clears throat> and bringing the attention when you are ready back to the screen. Well. Sati and Samadhi, I'm going to post the two questions for you now. And you can start writing reflections on today's practice. Any questions, maybe related to sati and samadhi or truly anything else. Here is the question to sati. And here is the question to reflect samadhi practice. Okay. Yeah, Caroline, go well. Thank you for being here with us. So, 
uh, what came up for you during practice? Anything within these questions which has the potential to change perspective of practice for you? Like the little word bhavana, what could cultivation of heart-mind be for you? Maybe something you already did. Nicola writes, I did some nourishing stretching movements that helped me to concentrate. Beautiful, Nicola. That is such an important um, aspect you're mentioning. Sometimes, especially our bodies, full of their kaya sankara, their activation of the whole day, they are not ready yeah, to sit still or to stand still. Um, these kaya sankara, they get amplified and they get so loud when we come too abruptly to our stillness. So stretching, yoga, dance. Even this just slightly rocking forwards and backwards, sideways during meditation can be a beautiful way to soothe the heart mind into, into samadhi. Beautiful. Ruth is writing, thank you for the invitation to, impro to be improvis yeah, that is an English word, a component, improvisatory with the anchor. I offered my heart, mind, the mountain in spring that is outside my window. Beautiful. It was Beautiful and tender. And then without even noticing the mountain, I began to breathe. And my anchor became the breath. Lovely. This natural, almost organic shift. Yeah, Like before we had it with Nicola, first the, the anchor in the movement, in the stretching. Yeah, And then it shifts. The mind says, okay, I've been nourished and fed by this first anchor that were the qualities which helped me to settle and then the, the, the attention naturally shifts organically shifts to something calmer yeah to something calmer to something steadier yeah and it needs to be fed by something else so sometimes this holding on to the one anchor um not so helpful actually lovely thank you Ruth, for pointing that out natalie's writing Dear Ulla, thank you for such a soft, gentle and tender guided meditation. You mentioned the relationship between the observer and the observed. What is the relationship? <laughs> my my laptop froze in that moment. Okay, I think when you notice, um, very often um, there is a relationship between observer and observed and it can have all kinds of dif um, different qualities. It can be this feeling of, ah, oh, is there something coming up, popping up, which we're going to be stressful, overwhelming, painful. Or it can be this, my mind did that this morning. Um, oh, have you noticed that problem? Have you noticed that tension? Did you notice that the back is feeling like this? Or did you notice, you know, um, it can be a critical gaze. It can be all kind of gazes. And we have, for example, qualities which we relate to um, from the field of the Brahma Viharas, care, compassion, spaciousness, friendliness, so all kind of different qual relational qualities. And guess what we do in Brahma Vihara practice? <laughs> we cultivate the ones which will be nourishing, giving us a sense of safety and relationship, which will be beneficial. Yeah, so one can summarize Brahma Vihara practice in choosing relationship between observer and observed, which is going to be beneficial. Chen is writing, Thank you so much for lending me your compassionate voice for my heart mind when, someti when sometimes it is so hard to grant it to myself. Beautiful, beautiful. I've had people who said, I practice imagining the teacher, whatever teacher, standing beside me, guiding me through my practice. And I'm lending in imagination myself this voice for a while. Yeah, just for a while when you don't need it anymore, you drop it. Yeah, and we, we can know that. This is not a reality. The person is not next to me. But lending that compassionate voice, beautiful. So that is a tool to work with, saying, oh, these compassionate voices, this is what helps my heart mind to settle. Something to play and experiment with. Great. Linda writes, my mind is always trying to understand what I'm doing and what, it, what it's called while meditating. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like, hmm, this slightly anxious part of saying oh, but, but what are we doing here is this safe is this okay is this what we should be doing saying yeah look we trust in that it feels really good we trust that this feels soothing nourishing <laughs> giving a bit more peace 
can you notice that dear mind it's okay what we're doing maybe some sort of that and it might give it the permission to say okay i don't need to watch that all so tight so so neatly yeah nita says thank you for your kind and gentle approach instead of forcing to still what mind and body yeah we can force mind and body but it has a cost and it has a backlash so it sometimes i do that ex, at the beginning of a meditation when i notice there is really a lot of stuff going on which feels unhelpful yeah so i will start a meditation with breathing in breathing out breathing in breathing out not having the slightest intention to continue to do that for any longer than necessary because while bringing a bit of umph into the meditation i notice that the mind let's go of something else and then i usually go into gentleness and tenderness that can be one way too and it's absolutely up to us to choose the tools appropriate yeah sue is writing back to the ethics if i focus too much on my good ethical choices then i'm concerned yeah i will become big headed big ego yeah beautiful any thoughts um we will be very humbled very soon when we practice ethics because you will notice that um, there aren't always good intentions and there aren't always good ethical choices. Um, we notice another of the Buddha's teachings coming in very soon, which is the teaching of not self. Yeah, to say, who <laughs> I can practice to bring up those good qualities and what does help me to bring up good qualities but i'm not in charge here yeah i'm not in charge i'm not saying i'm gonna do this and i'm not gonna do that it's not so easy if we cling to the idea of the self of i making good choices we will run into painful things so partially ethics is also an invitation to look into dependent arising to look into not self to look into um impermanence yeah so it's all within the picture ethics as i said yesterday unfathomable deep, deep and we can do a whole if you like to a whole session on ethics um yeah we, we, we see <laughs> steph is writing sometimes i feel sabotaged by a yucky feeling a horrible thought image what to do when this happens yeah now we have and we all know that to some degree Heart mind like being a pool, like a, a, a pool, a spring of water, or something like a pond, and all things pop up from this pond. Fish come up to the surface, or we, a plant or a frog hops in, and um, depending on the rippling effect that makes and the unpleasantness attached to a thought or an image, it charges the whole system. Yeah, the image comes up, the thought comes up, and because it's so unpleasant. And maybe because it's linked to self and saying, oh, I shouldn't be thinking this, or I shouldn't even have this image, the rippling effect gets large. Yeah. The more spaciousness we can create upon uh, around whatever comes up from this pond and saying, not me, not mine, yuck, what was that thought? Yeah, like really have this yucky feeling saying, oh, is this unpleasant? Yeah. Um, not me, not mine, put it back into the pond where it belongs. It's all about creating this spaciousness so maybe in the moment where the yucky thing comes up to remember yeah yucky thing is there and i remember spaciousness because i notice i'm aware still aware of noticing the space around me feet there hand there beautiful um to create spaciousness again <clears throat> claire is writing instead of being frustrated with my to-do list making mind i was able to feel grateful for its concerns yeah beautiful and just say later later and come back to the breath beautiful yeah that was the image of the really it's a form of housekeeper you yeah, know saying oh let's not forget that i want to keep you safe i want to keep um i want to have your good experience so we need to remember all those things and it's so concerned yeah and and this kindness you bring in there claire beautiful the image of mary writes the image of giving attention as a gift really changes things yeah yeah and it changes things also from my consumer's perspective. Have I ever told you how I practiced with Robin, my son, um, resilience to advertisement, I called it. So we, we went on the bus and uh, we looked at the different things the advertisement displayed to us. And we practiced saying, no, you don't get 
I said to Robin, you don't get my money or you don't get my attention. I don't need that, that, that. Yeah. And he was really a happy boy saying, you don't get me. You don't get my attention. Like not being won over. And sometimes we can do this with our hard minds as well to say, oh, are you bringing up the thought the 121st time of being there? We thought that through. Not now. Really not now. But there are those other beautiful things and nourishing things to pay attention to. Yeah. It's a gift. Heidi writes, lovely calming meditation to this this morning, so helpful while my body's rebelling against sending meditation. Yeah. I just allowed it to have this its little tantrum, beautiful, and ask what I could offer to make it more comfortable, beautifully practiced. Yeah. Standing meditation can be such a challenge for so many of us. I have people on retreats getting all dizzy and because we're not used to stand for a long time. There is yeah, I could do sessions on that while doing a lot of Qigong myself. What I notice where we habitually hold tension, which then makes it hard to breathe and stand relaxed. Yeah, So beautiful, this question. What could I offer to make it more comfortable? And, and actually to allow the body in standing meditation to be a little bit in movement and find its way. Yeah. So Roger is asking whether there is a way to we watched the talk on ethics from yesterday and I think someone, yeah, Ruth already took care of that. Beautiful. Thank you. And Martin is writing, when the observed is particularly unpleasant and creating a lot of tension, not only with oneself, but with a group of people, is being too understanding for person the wrong thing to do? Yeah. Yeah. We have different hard qualities. We have four rough categories of Brahma Viharas. One is certainly um, the care and compassion aspect. And then we have Upeka too. And Upeka is the spaciousness, looking upon something creates spaciousness and a healthy, a healthy, appropriate distance to experience. So sometimes we need to shift between the two because if I go too caringly, too compassionately into something, I might actually fall over the fine line of uh, co-suffering yeah and maybe sometimes like something like pity yeah so maybe then to shift a little bit more or to remember that spaciousness aspect can be very helpful my team stevie's writing i have been forcing things partially to get away from pain and fear yeah but finding spaciousness beautiful yeah now look at that reaction to force something in order not to not feel something else that is something to respect yeah um just to expose ourselves to pain and fear or inner dynamics i don't find it wholesome yeah the mind has a reason why it's wanting to go away from that saying i can't hold that it would be overwhelming so can we learn how to establish and root and ground and nourish ourselves in some experience not touching pain and fear in the beginning yeah and then expose ourselves in small doses to that which is painful and fearful yeah, so that we come from a grounded and nourished place. I find that very, very important in our practice. Okay, enough for today and many, many thanks for your lovely contributions. Tomorrow we are going to talk about the trajectory of our practice, our image of how we should be when we practice one year, two years, where we should be already and how we have always this image of linear development, yeah, going from straight from A to B and how it's so often not the case and maybe me offering you a different image to understand practice and the Eightfold Path and all of this um, work we're doing. Lovely. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a joy to be with you. And if you have questions or anything, send me an email. Be well uh, wherever you go and whatever you do.